knocked out at 96. I was 14. Um, I can still remember where I was when he died. Um, I was at uh, Jai Israel's house. That mean a lot to me. You know what I'm saying? You see Ho, super Ho fan. Like, you know what I'm saying? What does Ho mean to, mean to you? Ho is like Emma's. Is Emma's was the greatest fish spot on earth. <laughs> uh, atomic bomb that was dropped in those communities, which is crack cocaine. And it became known as the dope era. And lost the home. Now they kids is going back to rent. And now they kids is in the 90s. They don't have no homes. They apartment living. They drug babies. They either crack babies or they're drug babies themselves. And now they're going. And now it's like, now the after effect is, look at what you're dealing with now. And then I pimp. <laughs> but I don't pimp on black women, though. Only white. Then you'll see Louis Vuitton doing the same thing. You look at what, what Virgil was able to do as a black designer. He was able to take what something our culture was prying on and praying on with the Jordans, the fives and things like that. Has nothing to do with where you are. Where you are is not who you are. Of what's going on, how can someone afford that? Here's displacement. Displacement leads to homelessness. Homelessness leads to crime. Crime leads to more incarceration. You create another prison pipeline. We wish y'all nothing but the best. Rockin' with my man Ace. What's going on guys? Welcome to downtown Oakland, California. A lot of you guys told me I need to check in with someone dope. So we're gonna walk to a dope store to check out this dope person. Maybe they can tell me about this place. But so far my impression of downtown Oakland is amazing, man. The infrastructure here is beautiful. This is, this is, this is pure artwork. The only problem I've noticed about this place is the ghost town for downtown, right? Yeah thing I think it's still uh, still prolonging so a lot of stores are closing early I believe around 6 7 p.m. a lot of things are shutting down so just know that and here it is it's called the dope era okay and he's a fly uh, car in front of it and an interesting person in front of the door dope Era was a term that people would use growing up in the 80s and the 90s um, to hey love how are you uh, to anybody that's familiar with what's going on and what happened in America in the 80s and the 90s, it was uh, uh, governmental social engineering to destroy the black communities in some of the areas that uh, black dominance and prominent real estate owners and, and, and people that uh, ruled their neighborhoods with a strong fist, uh, community governing and all of those other things, those were the areas that were hit the hardest. Um, when you look at New York, you look at Baltimore, you look at Los Angeles, yeah, yeah. you look you at, hey, work, good brother. brother, appreciate you, good brother. Uh, you look at Oakland, California, um, the home and the central unit of black intelligence from the 60s and the 70s with the Black Panthers and things like that. Uh, you look at the social engineering uh, atomic bomb that was dropped in those communities, which is crack cocaine, and it became known as the dope era. It was a time where drugs were flooded in all of these communities, and you would see uh, a high influx of drug addictions, drug peddling, uh, drug usage, and, and, and drug settling. And that was known as the dope era. But when you think back on those times and you say, everything was dope in that era except for the dope. And if you remove the dope, then one thing that was prominent was black successful millionaires, whether they were street millionaires or however they got their money, but it was ownership. It was people that were in the communities that uh, would do certain things and they had uh, a standstill in the community that was still black. And when you go to those areas, uh, the dope and the drugs destroyed those communities. And we wanted to do something that was re uh, We kind of like reinvented that and removed the dope. And so the refurbishing of those times, idealistically, through fashion, through current times, through community involvement, through philanthropy, through music, through soul, through uh, just the uh, simple merits of life. And kind of like refurbish that and re reinvigorating that into our communities and today and making it a dope era. Awesome, man. You seem to be very black conscious. And I, you know, I look at everything you have here. What sparked that flame? Is it Oakland? Was that just the culture of Oakland that did that for you? Oakland was a multitude of things. Yeah. Um, in the 60s, as I alluded to, uh, which was, you know, much before my time. Yeah. But uh, the seeds that were planted from there, I had family members that were Black Panthers. On the flip side of that, because there's always a yin and a yang, there's always a yin and a yang, and in that yin and a yang, uh, the flip side of that is 
when there's a positive, there's a negative, or what, whatever we could see, there would be uh, an opposite. So we had the Panthers on one side, and this was around the times of black exploitation. And black exploitation, uh, a lot of the black exploited films were highlighting the pimps, the pimps and the players. And one of the biggest movies that was uh, a direct exemplification of that was The Mac, which was filmed in Oakland, California. And even in that movie, they described the struggle. You had Goldie on one end, that was the pimp. And then on the flip side, his brother was the Black Panther that was trying to clean up the community. And that was actually the life that existed in Oakland, California. So years later, the offsprings of those pimps, of those Panthers, they birthed us. So that, and, and, and in the birthing of us, our knowledge becomes so well rounded. So you might have a conscious pimp. It may be a nigga like, yeah, man, I'm pimp. <laughs> and I don't pimp on black women, though. Only white. <laughs> so, so, you know what I'm saying? So, but that was just uh, the oxymoron and contradictive state of Oakland, California. Uh, interesting you mentioned Offsprings, uh, Tupac. Most definitely. Um, uh, parents were Black Panthers. Um, how do you feel about Pac? I, I saw an interview, it was a brief interview. Um, did you have any encounters with Tupac or in this? I wish. Okay. I wish. Um, Pac died in 96. I was 14. Um, I can still remember where I was when he died. Um, I was at uh, Jai Israel's house. And um, it affected me. It affected me deeply. Um, because to us, Pac was uh, our black Jesus. You know, and he, it was that spiritual. It was that spiritual with Tupac, just based off the fact that he was the voice of the young, lost, indecisive, undecided black man in America. And he was our voice. He was speaking for us. And whatever it was that he was saying, we stood on that like that was Bible. That was scripture to us. Seven day theory, that was scripture. That was like revelations. Me against the world, that was Genesis. You know? Tupacalist now, those were the in his Genesis. That was scripture to us. So we hung on his words. So when he was like, young black male may not make it till he's 25, we were already planning our death by then. I remember when I seen 25, I was like, damn, man, I'm 25. I did the same thing You know what I'm too. saying? I was like, whoa, I'm 25, oh, that's yeah. crazy. Yeah. And so, um, something that stood out in the significance of Tupac of what we're talking about and his brilliance. Uh, he once said, I may not be the one to change the world, but I will plant the seed in the mind of that one that will. And here it is, we're changing the narrative. Now we no longer have to have the desolate, hopeless, young black man theory. Psychologically, we breaking those chains. And the narrative now is, we can be successful young black men. We can own clubs, we can own fashion stores, and we can own nail shops, and we can be in our communities. We don't have to be afraid of our people. We can still do all of that, empower our folks, and still stand on, on the street line with our folks. We're not in no hidden area right now. We're right here in the thick of things. There's been two, three murders in the past week here, down right here in the in the Broadway downtown district. You see, I'm outside in flip flops. Yeah, I saw you just hanging out. You feel me? <laughs> yeah. With a Lamborghini parked in front of the hood, and I and, and I ain't, I ain't doing that to be like, oh, I'm stunting. No, I'm with my people. No, but as I was waiting for this interview to start, I just see all the like people just coming out of the train station, and right. like uh, the whole community here was greeting you, you, if not you, your business. Right. So it seems like this, this is a very very important part of the that the neighborhood right here. You, you you can't be for your people if you're not with your people. Many kings have failed because they removed themselves from those that they govern over. Nice. They've hot they're 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 they are they 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 have hit themselves and the drawbridge hasn't been dropped in so long that they no longer what you know you know how many kings have lost their common touch? has lost their ruling. I keep your common touch. You can't be, you know, for your people if you ain't with your people.
So how you hey, good brother. How you feeling? Edgar, Edgar. All right, Sam, all right, Sam, Edgar. What's Sam, up, man? The, the, the how you feeling? Here. They help you. Let us know over here. It's all good, baby. All right, y'all. All right. Just like clockwork, you know what I mean? That's how it happens. Truth come with a witness. Yeah. Um, you you talked about uh, empowerment and you uh, clubs and so you you got a lot of stuff happening right now. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Okay, you got a club that you're opening up. Yeah. You could talk about that and um, nightclub called Desi's. My mother name was Desi. Uh, Desiree actually and uh, it was always her dream to own a nightclub you know when she was young she would you know bartend and she would manage certain clubs when she was young and she would always say things like man I can't wait to have my own club I can't wait and she me not knowing but hey hey now me not knowing but as I as I get older I reflect back on it and I see what she was doing she was planting those seeds she would say things like I can't wait till you get older to buy me that club you know, I can't wait till certain things that she was just embedding in me. And it was, to me, it was unavoidable. It was, uh, it, it, I had no other option but to do it. And so, uh, bestowed upon me was an opportunity to seize the moment to get that club. And why would I name it anything else but my mother's name? So, the nightlife is uh, Club Desi's. And the, the beauty of it is, we have a clothing store directly across the street, which is like, you know, um, in a parallel universe, that would be considered perfect. You know? You know the utopia of that is amazing. Mm -hmm. And here we are, you know, reflecting upon that. Here's a young black boy from Oakland, California, being able to uh, live up to the epitome of dreams do come true. How is life in Oakland right now? We're in Oakland, guys. Uh, downtown area, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So how is life right now in terms of... Uh after pre-COVID, is the energy still there, or there's a lot of more opportunities um, living here now? That's subjected to pers uh, perspectively speaking. Yeah. For every individual, there's a different perspective of how life is. If you ask how life is for me, uh, it's dandy. You know, um, I'm healthy. My family is healthy. My kids are good. Uh, my businesses are flourishing. Um, and I'm continuing to continue to keep living in my path. Um, my spirit, my mental, and, and all of those things are aligned. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm happy. I'm at peace. Uh, but you can ask an individual that may be standing next to me, and they'll give you a different perspective. So I think that's uh, subjectively speaking, based on someone's perspective of their situation. Yeah, because I've noticed, uh, well, ever since I got to California, that there's been this uh, talk about homelessness in um, LA and then you come to San Francisco and now you're in uh, Oakland and you, you hear it over and over again. Uh, what do you think, what do you think is the reason for the homelessness and how could that change if there's a way of, of that change? A displacement, uh, economical displacement. And in that economical displacement you have uh, Gentrification has come in and replaced a lot of things. When we talk about, see things trickle. Okay. And in the trickling of these things, chronologically, it begins to make sense. We talk about the Panthers in the 60s. We talk about the pimps in the 70s. We talk about the drugs in the 80s talk about the after effect of those three tyrants. Then you look at where it is now. In the 60s, your grandmother owned a home. In the 70s, your she's, grandmother's home. She's either renting, she's getting, she lost her property. In the 80s, she didn't sold her home for some drugs or she died and her kids were on drugs or they were selling drugs and now they didn't lost the home. Now they kids is going back to rent and now they kids is in the 90s, they don't have no homes, they apartment living, they drug babies, they either crack babies or they're drug babies themselves and now they're going and now it's like, now the after effect is, look at what you're dealing with now. You're dealing with a community of displaced individuals, mentally, spiritually and physically and most of all financially. 
You're looking at the influx of gentrification through Silicon Valley of what a lot of people are saying. I don't want to live in Silicon Valley, but I want to work there because that's where all the jobs are. And then in the tech world, here it is. Now we're going to find a place to live. San Francisco is extremely high, so let's go over the bridge. It's high, but it's not that high. It's affordable. Let's start buying these houses that's still available on the market. Let's buy these same houses that once was prominently owned by black people, predominantly owned by black people. And now the people that's in the communities who look at them as bandos, who look at them as abandoned houses, who walk past them because they see no true value in them, these other people that come in and say, hey, man, I want to buy that. I'm going to put a gate around it. I'm going to put a lawn see down. beyond the, ba the bando. I'm going to put a gate around it. I'm going to put a lawn down. Yeah. And now in this abandoned house that I bought for 300, 400,000, now there's a million dollar property. Now if it's a $1 million property on a block, that means that the house next door to it will become a million, that will become a million. So now you live in the community, now all of the property value is up. Who can afford that? When there's no rent control, so now my landlord can say, oh shit, there's a property next door that's charging 4,000 a month. Well, I'm gonna charge 4,000 a month. If your minimum wage is not equivalent to the market of what's going on, how can someone afford that? Here's displacement. Displacement leads to homelessness. Homelessness leads to crime. Crime leads to more incarceration. You create another prison pipeline. You hit it right there on the dot. But is it still worth living here? Of course. So this is a travel channel. What do you think would be, for someone the first time coming out here, what they should check out when they come out of Oakland? What should you check out when you come to Oakland? Besides the dope, <laughs> the dope era. <laughs> Um, and the club. <laughs> Oakland is a historical city, man. And even in the midst of all of the things that I explained, yeah. it's still a beautiful city. Yeah. It's still a city that still has culture. Even in the midst of gentrification, even in the midst of all of those things. Pete, hold on. Pete, man, I appreciate you, man. And uh, this week, man, we get up and put some stuff together, man, but I appreciate you. No problem, sir. If you need anything from us, you let us know. Will do. My man. Thank you. Can I get a photo with you? Because people don't can. believe I had. I didn't. Can you take a photo for me? Sure, sure. No problem. No problem. <laughs> I hate being the guy that's like, that's all good. Oh, wait. You, <laughs> you being all professional, like, damn, I can't wait to take a picture. <laughs> I know, I waited so long. All right, cool, cool. I got you, man. Great, thank you, man. Thank you, Richard. I'll call you, you tell, this week. You tell Karen that hey, you came out and did a good job. I got you, man. I appreciate you, baby. And uh, I, I saw this dude uh, the other day, or no, it's today. He's running like a longboard. Uh -huh. like, Cookies van, like longboard. It's like, oh, yeah, yeah. That's my guy with the dress. That's my <laughs> yeah. guy, Phil. Yeah, for sure. Like, he's wearing dope or something. Like, it's my guy. <laughs> so I love, baby. Yeah. I got you, man. I appreciate thank you. you. All right. Um, like, good places to go. The food is always good. You got a. Uh, Everett and Jones, black owned barbecue. Went there last night. Black owned they, barbecue. They're the ones that told me to come. For here. sure, black owned. I see, that's crazy. Yeah. Black owned barbecue. You got um, Southern Cafe. You have a uh, Touch of Soul. Um, visit some of the black uh, businesses. M2. M2 is owned by uh, a man named Chris Rochelle who's owned several businesses in Oakland for the past two, two decades. Very successful businessman. He's a mentor of mine. Um, a historical club named Jeffrey's down downtown when Jeffrey's is open. Jeffrey's so rich now, he don't even open the club all the time. But the significance of that was Jeffrey was like a cotton club where no black people could even go inside. And now that whole he owns that whole block over there. Awesome. Uh, he's like he's one of the forefathers uh, of you know the club nightlife of Oakland, California. He's a he's a goat what we would like to call, like, you know what I'm saying, Jeffrey is a, a hero to me. Um, the Huey Newton statue, which is on Mandela, which is actually called Huey Newton what Parkway now. Uh, it's uh, Mandela Road and, and where Huey Newton, where his upbringing was in West Oakland. He has a statue there, a commemorative statue that they just recently put up. Oh, I gotta check that out. Uh, the, the Oakland Museum. What's your favorite restaurant or like what, if, something you like to eat? from Oakland, that you gotta get it from Oakland here. I love Southern Cafe, man. Uh, Touch of Soul, Touch of, but Touch of Soul is in Emeryville, but it's still, you know, we look at that, that's Oakland. Uh, Touch of Soul, Southern Cafe, like, that's just Oakland. 
Yeah, them, them, them the spots, man. Them like, them are home spots where you like, yeah, I gotta go there. Like, let me, let me pull up. You know what I'm saying? Let me pull up. What, uh, wait, if I go to Touch Your Soul, what I'm, what I'm ordering? So it depends on what you like to eat. Okay. You know, okay. like you a pescatarian, you could order, you know, get whip up. Whip up some, you get the Fabby special or something. All right, all right, hey, man, thank y'all so much, man. Appreciate yeah, you, anger, man. My love. Right, thank y'all, right, man. Right. Thank you. Right. We used to have a spot called Emma's, though, man. Like, Emma's. Bro, I wish they'd bring Emma's back, bro. Like, Emma's is. Emma's was the greatest fish spot on earth. <laughs> oh, my, oh, my God. I swear to God. Okay. But you got, uh, oh, you got chef, you got Smelly's. So, Smelly is a, uh, Chef Smelly is, uh, he started up doing pop ups. Okay. Like outside, street vending. And you could call him and place an order and just be like, you know, he'll come pull up on you. But now he has a spot not too far from here. Uh, Chef Smelly's. He's a, he's a, uh, he be popping, man. Chef Smelly's is good. You got to catch Chef Smelly on the weekends. Get a chance to go up in there, man. He got good, good food. Uh, there's a couple other people, man. Um, so it just all depends on what you like to eat. For real. Okay. Yeah, man, we started out the trunk, man. Okay. We started off uh, me and my two brothers, man. My biological brother and my best friend, who is no longer here. Uh, he passed yeah. a year ago, man. And it was like, you know, um, us two and our other brother, which is, you know, our childhood friend, Crip. And we was just sitting up joking one day, man, talking about some stuff, just, you know, cracking jokes about how dope would something be if we did something, something. And we were like, yo, what if you put this on this? And one of us was like, yo, what if you put this on the shirt and you said that it was this? He's like, ooh. And then you said, what if we took the gun from Nintendo and you put it on the shirt? And he was like, that's my first strap. And we was just joking. It's like, ooh, that'd be hard. And my brother's a graphic designer, um, duct tape. He's okay. a graphic designer. And he was like, bro, I'm going to create it for you. Hey, mom. He was like, uh, I'm going to create it for you. So he created a mock, and I was like, ooh, that's hard. I'm like, man, where, where, where we go get that shit pressed up at? Got some shirts pressed up, did about 20 shirts, 25 shirts. Man, and lo and behold, man, those shirts like flew like crazy because it struck a nerve. See, nostalgia and nostalgic things strike nerves in people. Because you never know where a person was at that time in their life. When you see something that's an old idea or something that you were raised on. or It's like, we look at these Jordans. And when we were young, a lot of us couldn't afford Jordans. Yeah. So when we got to an age where we were able to buy a pair of Jordans, some of us overdid it. It was like, now I want 10 pair of them. I mean, my mama couldn't even afford them, so then we went in the chest and we got them. So when you strike nerves in people, and our clothing line okay. was that. And so we just refurbished ideas from that time. So come with me, man. I'll show you a few ideas that we, you know. And flipping certain ideas. This right yeah, here. Yeah, I saw it's that. Like white team, blue jeans, and Nike. Now, this was a song that a legendary artist from our city, he had a song. It was a huge song. His name is Keek the Sneak. And white tee, blue jeans, and Nikes around the country, that was the dope boy dress code. Even though the song was huge here in other areas, this right here was the... I can remember Cash Money. <laughs> you get what I'm saying? White tee, blue jeans. And they reads. They had yeah, they read. That yeah. was, that's a street starter kit. You feel me? <laughs> so then, of course, you know, we always have things that are... Um, a direct of culture of like you know what I'm saying we 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 want to tie into the culture we want to be current times yeah. current topics yeah uh, four fingers you know what I'm saying for the four ranks to the people that know that's the Warriors so you know yes, what I'm sir. saying we, yes, we we run right here with the Warriors the Golden State team the champions the number one team in the world uh, so we did the four finger rang bang uh, the logo here was definitely strike similarities to the Mario Brothers. And the significance of that was, growing up, that was many of our safe haven. A lot of people, right. Mario Brothers stand in the house playing those video the games. Mario that, Kart. You know, it kept, it kept a lot of kids out of the streets, especially in the 80s and the 90s. You know, even when your parents couldn't afford it, sometimes they went and bought a Nintendo because they knew that that would save your life. They'd rather you be in the room playing video games than being out in the streets. 
you know, and so Mario Brothers was a big part of our childhood, so I wanted to kind of like refurbish that idealistically in doing it. And uh, some of the ideas are just flips, man. Like you see here, the, the Air Boys, that's some bad boys. It's just a flip, you know, a lot of things done it. You know, the people, some of the the, the, the the lash that we have, if there is, you know, there's not always, like I say, there's a positive, there's a negative. Some of the negative feedback that we get, it's like, oh, y'all taking these ideas and y'all doing this. But in our defense, I tell people this, in fashion, people have been doing that for years. You look at a pair of Skechers, then go look at a pair of Balenciagas, it's the same shoe. You look at a pair of Steve Madden's and then you'll see Louis Vuitton doing the same thing. You look right, at what, right. what Virgil was able to do as a black designer, he was able to take what something our culture was prying on and praying on with the Jordans, the Fives and things like that, and then he just put the Louis Vuitton touch to it. And it touches us because it triggers something. It's like, oh, these high-end Jordans. So fashion always does that. So when people are out there trying to knock somebody for um, being influenced, knock it off. Muhammad Ali said, a good artist is original. A great artist is a kleptomaniac. Because you take bits and pieces from everyone and you curate your own style. And when you look at a person, it's like, damn, that's mega nigga right there. That nigga got everybody in him. And when you look at it, you see it. If one doesn't study from the generations before him, then he'll be only left to know what he knows. And if anyone is smart, they know that they don't know enough. And the more you learn, the more you realize you didn't know. So, always be creative. You know, grab and pick yeah, yeah, like those jackets right there, man. Yeah, no fair, man. That was... Some design we seen, we were probably somewhere overseas someday, one day, and I was just like, yo, I took a picture of it. I was like, bro, do something like this. And my brother cut it together, man. My brother's amazing, man. Duct tape, man. Y'all make sure y'all check him out. Duct tape graphics on Instagram. Uh, the, the, man, that dude, is a, he's, a, he's a genius, man. His brilliance is resilience. Like, what he continues to keep coming up with and curating, hey, he's amazing. Um, you'll see all art around here. I love art. I'm a huge art, uh, art fan. Um, if you take out the word art from earth, it's just eh. And you gotta always create art, man. I love art. Some would say that I'm into myself and I say I am. But <laughs> it's my daughter, my family. Family is big to me. That's my uncle. It's like around here, you see the whole stuff, man. It's all, it's all like people that mean a lot to me. You know what I'm saying? You see whole. Super Hove fan, like, you know what I'm saying? What does Hove mean to, mean to you? Hove is black excellence. Hove is, Hove is the top tier of black excellence from where we come from. You know what I'm saying? I'm, I'm a super huge Hove fan. Um, I got a lot of paintings. Got the early Hove, got the modern Hove. Got a lot of paintings of Jay. Jay's like, a, I'm a huge Jay-Z fan. Jay-Z shows me that it's possible. You know what I mean? Like I tell people all the time, this nigga sold crack, cuz. Nah, he's a billionaire. <laughs> Come on. Of course, you know, short dog. You can't say Oakland without saying too short. Um, Tupac. Can't say the Bay Area without saying Mac Dre. Um, then these here are the streets, like significant streets around Oakland and the Bay Area. It's just stuff art, man. I got into art early. This picture right here was a picture my dad drew for me. He was in a federal penitentiary. And he drew pictures for me and my cousin JDK. And he drew, drew us both pictures. But the pictures were of just stars. And he would say, hang these in your room. You got Michael there. I think it's crazy. It's like Michael in the middle. I'm a huge Michael Jackson fan. Don King. Deanna, uh, Diana Ross. Grace Jones. Shaka Khan. Uh, Billy In uh, James Ingram, Prince, DeBarge. It's it's kind of like messed up because it's I've had that picture since I was five years old, five yeah. or six years old. But um, and I think that's a replica. I don't know if that's the original. I think that that'd be a dope shirt. Oh yeah, that's hard. But the significance of it was my dad would always be like, I'm, "You're gonna be around the stars. Hang this up around." So you could always feel like you're around the stars. So when you get around the stars, be comfortable. It was really uh, prophetic of what my parents did for me. They would always embed that 
This is what you're going to do. This is what you're going to be. It's inevitable. You just got to follow your path. And in following my path, man, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm continuously uh, trotting this journey and I'm, I'm happy about it. Let me ask you a question, last question, because I know you're a busy man. Um, what could you tell somebody that's uh, down and out, doesn't know what he needs to do in life, um, in terms of encouragement to follow their own path? Don't give up. That simple. Don't give up. You know what I'm saying? Do not give up. Dope Air Magazine, make sure I check that out. Same as plugs. Um, don't give up, man. Um, my uncle, man, this dude has been a dude, man, and his story, like, he has a book right here. We got books as well. All right. But these are our books. Um, his book is called Unk's Advice. Um, one of my books is called The Airway. Uh, another one of my books, I have another one of our books in there. I got kids' books, a couple other books that we wrote and published. But um, my brother's book, it's called Convicted Redemption. My brother's been in jail for the past 30 years, um, 27 years. And in my uncle's book, he talks about, like I'll read the page. He said, from the age of 19 to 43, I was a lost soul. I was caught up in a very powerful cycle of self-destruction. I went from being a kid athlete to being a criminal, a drug addict. And for the longest time, I couldn't get myself out of the hole I had dug for myself. I lacked self-confidence and self-love. I lied to myself and kept me on the destructive path. I couldn't figure out the problem until it hit me. I was the problem. In this book, I share with you the lessons that I've learned on the past, and it will help anyone that is stuck on the same similar path to find their way out. To find their way out. It is also prevention for anyone that has a dark path awaiting for them. For a man that fought an addiction for 20 some years to say, I've come out of the darkness and in my darkness I awaken in the light and I show you that a light is possible from darkness. Many people feel that they don't have the possibility of being that light because they're surrounded in darkness until we step outside. So many of our days are nights until we prospectively change the way that we look at things. And when you look at things differently, the things you look at appear to be different. And it's all about life like that, perspective, perception. Some people may look outside and see a car. Some people may get in details like, oh, that's a Mercedes, that's this, that's this, that's that. Some people may be like, oh, that's a blue car. When you change the way you look at things, the things you look at change. So instead of looking at yourself like a failure, instead of looking at yourself like um, you're condemned to where you are now, who you are has nothing to do with where you are. Where you are is not who you are. You might be in a dark place. That don't make you a dark person. That's just the proximity of your location right now. It's up to you to change the demographics of your surroundings, of your feelings, but as first, self-recognition starts with, where am I going wrong? And once you hold that accountability to self, things begin to change. Light is not inevitable for someone that is in darkness. They just have to trigger that light of themselves, just like you trigger anything else. Success and failure requires the same amount of energy, just in opposite ways. So with saying that, we wish y'all nothing but the best. Rocking with my man Ace, it's the dope bear. Dope Air stands for developing opportunity for people to evolve and everyone rises above. And when you do that, you put yourself in a greater air. Everything was dope in the air but the dope. Y'all have a go. Uh, All right, guys, thanks for watching this video. More on the way from your boy Ace. If you are coming to Oakland, make sure you make a stop right here. Address will be in the description. More links in the description. And yeah, man, uh, thanks for watching. See you in the next one. And uh, yeah, man, keep it dope. Yo. I'm speechless, man. I'm speechless. I'm spe Walking around like a little kid up in here. <laughs> I'm speechless, man. Dang, man. Yeah, that's the, that's the history right there.